at the stream. Oh, there I am. Still trying to figure out uh, um, what is StreamYard, everybody. So still a rookie at all of this. Trying to pull up the... Uh, so hope everybody's having a good day. Um, thank you, Mods, for... Um, for coming in this morning, for being on my stream with me this morning. Um, let me, unfortunately, I'm, I'm in, uh, in StreamYard, so it doesn't show all the comments. I'm trying to pull up, uh, my, um, forgive me all, trying to bring up my live stream on YouTube right now. Um, and so up, oh, there we go. Um, let me say good morning to some people. Let's see, start at the very top. First one in this morning was Geek Boy, here a half hour early. Wow, Misfits, Reptiles and Aquatics. Good morning, sir. Sorry, I haven't been catching your uh, your stream lately. Uh, Mystery Snail Gardens, Hippie John, the Fisherman. Let's see, Paul Sotero, one of the mods. Um, and let's see, Fishimon again, and Rico Stan. Thank you for coming in this morning. Uh, Debbie Holding. And if you come in uh, later, I will say goodbye to you or goodbye. <laughs> I would say hello to you uh, later on. Um, so what I want to do this morning, ah, that's what I forgot. I forgot to put my pretty light on to make me look good. Uh, we're going to talk about marine fishes. You know, I, I talk about freshwater fishes a lot. That is my hobby, freshwater fishes. We do have a marine tank. but in some ways, I'm um, I'm a little against marine tanks. Primarily, in the past, it was because of the raping and pillaging that was happening in many of the reefs around the world. Use of dynamite, use of uh, cyanide on the reefs. Those fish didn't last too long in the hobby, so it gave the hobby a black eye. And they were decimating reefs in in so doing all of that uh, collecting. So what I wanna do today is talk about the problems it is in, in trying to culture marine fish and highlight a few companies that I know do captive raising, captive breeding. I am in no way associated with any of these companies that I'm gonna highlight. Uh, a few of these companies, I been in contact with in the past, but I have never purchased fish from them. They don't send me free fish. Um, they don't give me any of their revenues. These are just companies that I know do captive breeding. And I, I think they should be highlighted and applauded uh, for doing what they do. So I'm gonna share my screen first, share screen. Let's see, share the entire screen. Okay, let's see. Am I bringing up the right page? Yep. So one of the problems that we have with marine fish is that, um, Oh, 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 is, is this. Um, this is a typical life cycle of, of any fish, um, no, matter, no matter what fish it is. Um, so the adults will spawn. And for most marine fishes, the eggs that they spawn are minute, tiny, tiny, tiny eggs. The eggs then spend time in the water column. In other words, the, the adults are normally have 
in most cases are going to be pelagic spawners. In other words, they spawn and they release their, their gametes into the water column. And I'll actually show you a video of this uh, in a bit, a fish that I worked on many years ago. They develop, the embryos develop, the larvae stay within the water column. And it's only until after they become small juvenile fish that they will come back to, or they'll come to some reef. So the first part of their life is spent in the water column. And this is actually a, um, a photograph of a larval uh, damselfish. This bar here represents a half a micron. And just so you know, a uh, half a micron, um, one micron, or put it this way, 25,000. 400 microns make up an inch. So if this is the half a micron and that's about the width of its eye, its eye, so that's probably a good 10 microns long. That is a tiny, tiny, tiny baby. And in fact, that's that's an average size for a juvenile or, or an embryonic fish in the ocean. These things feed off of the smallest food particles, primarily to begin with rotifers and other micro microscopic organisms. And that's one of the reasons why most marine fishes aren't produced in captivity. The fact that they need the smallest, smallest food means that you have to be a polyculturist. In other words, you have to not only culture your fish, but you have to become really good at culturing the food that they eat. And in this case, it's going to be rotifers. Now, rotifers, we all can culture rotifers, but if you're going to do this as a business, you're going to need systems that are home swimming pool size. In other words, you're going to need to be producing that much food for these larvae because they're going to be continually needing to be fed. Now, if we look at, this is from a, a paper looking at uh, how long these Pacific and Atlantic damselfish uh, stay in the planktonic larval stage. And really, this is what you look for here. So on average, they're spending about 20 days in the larval column, at most 35 days. And minimum is about 12 days. So these are damselfishes. They're relatively small fish as adults. But if you imagine a large angelfish, they're probably going to be spending twice to three times that amount as a larvae. So if we look at those fish that tend to be cultured uh, in captivity, they tend to be the damselfish group, the pomocentric group, which includes clownfish, because their larval duration is relatively short compared to other things. Now, back in the um, 90s or 80s, I believe, or 1996, this book by Frank Hoff um, was published. Um, and so it was a a hands-on guide to how to culture, how to condition, how to rear um, marine fishes with emphasis at this case on clownfish. So clownfish are really the first fish that were brought in from the wild to breed in captivity. Uh, I've had this book forever. I've never actually bred clownfish, but it, it's an interesting book to have. Uh, it's really a guide, a recipe guide to how to do this whole process. And they'll go into, pro they'll go into how to culture the food, um, what conditions you need for the food, what conditions you need for the larvae. In many cases, the larvae are, are, are kept in the dark because they tend to be, you know, the 
currents are going to take them wherever they're going. They don't have the ability to swim at that point, hence the name plankton. Plankton tend to not be able to swim against the currents, or and they're only going where the currents take them. Um, and so it used to be that you, you kept these things in the dark, in continual motion, in kind of a, what we know today as, as a, an egg tumbler. Um, and But these were large egg tumblers, so to speak. Now, some fish tend to be relatively easy to culture in captivity, to have captive bred. And this is a Banga cardinal fish. Cardinal fishes are mouth brooders, just like many of the uh, uh, African cichlid mouth brooders. If you compare the number of eggs and the size of eggs between a mouth brooder and a, a pelagic spawner, uh, mouth brooding fish have fewer eggs, but the eggs are much larger. So these larvae, when they hatch and are released by the male, are much larger and they're able to eat larger food. So baby back, baby back, think of baby back ribs, uh, baby brine shrimp, they readily take baby brine shrimp and larger food. So they're they're much easier to take care of. And in fact, this is really um, important for the Bengay cardinal fish because the Bengay cardinal fishes were over collected after they were introduced to the hobby uh, in the late 90s. Uh, rapid, um, you know, rapid, rapid disappearance of fish. And so most of the fish that we have now in the hobby are from captive bred individuals. Okay, and so it's because, oh, no, 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 where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Uh, stop screen. Okay, there I am. Um, so it's only those fish that are easily fed in captivity uh, that are the ones that are captive bred. So let me share my screen again. I'm gonna share the screen. I'm gonna share a window. And of course I don't have that window up anymore. I am so sorry. Let's see if I can bring it up this way. Um, okay, spawn, okay. Uh, let me see if it'll share this way again. Um, there we go, right here. Share. So this this is an actual spawning event uh, in uh, surgeon fish that I work um, with in the Red Sea. I was actually looking at the mi migratory events of these fish. And so what we see is that every night during the summertime, these are the surgeon fishes. They will gather together and perform a mass spawning. And so they just kind of wiggle around. And all of a sudden you have these uh, females with about six males following her. And they will just release their gametes into the water column, hoping everything will mix together. So every night during the summer, about 3,000 fish would spawn every night. So what we're doing is we're collecting the eggs to look at fertilization success. The bluefish are fusilier fish, and these are egg predators. And so you have egg predators that go through and just consume eggs as they're being spawned. Once the eggs are fertilized, they become relatively uh, buoyant because the uh, egg yolk begins to develop. Um, but the water just becomes completely cloudy because of all these fish spawning. Okay, stop sharing. Now, just so you know, probably 
less than one tenth of one percent of all those eggs ever make it to the adult uh, stage. Oh, no video shown. Oh, oh, okay. Let me let me try it one more time, and I will. If it doesn't like full video, share screen, window, share. Let's go backwards. Uh, okay. So tell me if we're good here. Let's see. I'll look, make sure. Okay. So that's, that's, you can see the video now, yes? I need an assistant. Yeah, I need an assistant. Uh, so you can see the the fish, the brown fish or the brown surgeon fish, and they're performing this mass synchronous spawning. So again, we're collecting uh, eggs to look at fertilization success, and you can see the fusiliers opening and closing their mouths, and these are the initial egg predators to begin with, but a lot of filter feeders, the corals, the, you know, all the filter feeders in, um, in, in the water will filter out all these larvae. Okay. So one thing that we often thought of as we were working on these fish is that a lot of fish perform or undertake pelagic spawn. It may be a pair spawn. Uh, and they normally spawn at very predictable times. And so if it was allowable, you could collect these eggs and then raise those larvae in captivity. But again, the problem is feeding those larvae. So there has been su su some success and I'm gonna highlight uh, three companies that are actually um, breeding their own fish and selling them. Some are online, uh, two are an online source. One is actually a, a exporter uh, that sells to wholesalers all over the world. So the first is, uh, well, I guess I would have to share my screen again, sorry. Start sharing the news. Okay, entire screen. Click, share, and here it is. Um, hopefully it comes up. That's Alyssa's um, Seahorse Savvy. Alyssa Seahorse Savvy is, I believe, in one of the Carolinas, North or South Carolina. I forget now. Um, but what they do is is they captive breed, captive breed seahorses. And they get these seahorses to not only breed in captivity, but they get them to feed off of frozen food, frozen mice shrimp. One of the problems that we have in uh, wild caught seahorses is they tend to need live food. Many of us can't culture the live food enough. Adult brine shrimp, brine shrimp, uh, you know, it's good food, but it's lacking in some of the nutrition that they need. Um, by feeding them, be able to feed them frozen mycid shrimp, uh, they're much more accessible for the normal hobbyist. In other words, not a hobbyist who needs to culture their own food. And so there, there are all sorts of um, uh, color morphs. Uh, they're relatively expensive, so to speak, for seahorses. Um, but they are, um, they will breed for you. They will uh, feed for you. And so it's a fish that you don't have to worry about withering away in captivity. You know, seahorses do have some problems. Um, they, they will get a bloat. Uh, so you have to go in and 
you know, with a toothpick and poke or insert the toothpick into their uh, breeding pouch to release that uh, that gas. But in, in many cases, that's because of what they're eating. Um, they will start picking on things thinking that it's food, but it's not because they're going to be needing live food, except these don't. Um, and so all sorts of uh, color morphs, as well as they actually have um, mini seahorses, dwarf seahorses that they sell uh, as well. Let's see if they come up with dwarf seahorses. Um, nope, not on this page. But most of these seahorses are from the Atlantic coast, but here they do have uh, Australian seahorses. Unfortunately, their main page shows uh, the dragon uh, seahorse. Uh, there's only <laughs> few people in the world that are actually breeding those seahorses. Um, and most of those seahorses, where all those seahorses are actually going to uh, public aquariums. Um, so no one is breeding um, the Australian uh, dragon seahorse and putting them into the hobby. A, another group is this company called California Reef Company. Now, although I don't like these, um, you know, these color morphs, these designer morphs of clownfish. They actually have allowed the clownfish, native clownfishes in the Indo-Pacific to be collected less. And so there's more a reliance on these designer clownfish um, because they're so different. So if you look at them, these are all the color morphs uh, that California Reef Company is actually producing. They are a company out of the Bay Area here in California. The clownfish, even though they're designer, are relatively inexpensive if we think about what clownfish used to cost. Normal percula clowns now here uh, in California, even for captive bred, normal color morphs are $20 each. So these um, these designer clownfish are maybe twice to five times the cost. But if you want an all black clownfish, here's the midnight clownfish. $40 for a clownfish isn't really that bad. Now, I'm not sure if you're in the Midwest. I know we have some New Yorkers, people from Pennsylvania, Howdy Skipper. Um, and, you know, from the Carolinas, Dee Dee, I'm not sure how much they would cost you, but you can buy direct from this, this company. Um, so, you know, they do have normal Clark Eye, normal Clark Eye, <clears throat> pink skunk clownfish, cinnamon clownfish, and tomato clownfish, as well as some of the dotty backs that are being bred in captivity now. Um, so they're, they're doing a really good job at breeding these fish, feeding these fish, and bringing them to a life stage that can uh, easily be sold in the hobby. Now, one thing you must be aware of is if we go back to this, I only bring this website up because this is, uh, I know they have some of these fish. Um, but if we look at, um, let's say, some of the new arrivals, if it says aquarium conditioned, what aquarium condition means is these are wild caught fish that have been in their facility long enough where they are accepting of frozen foods. So not all the fish you see on some of these websites that have captive bred fish are actually captive bred fish. So here it's a captive bred nano uh, redhead goby, captive bred. Aquarium conditioned twin spot goby, but in this case, aquarium conditioned. And so you 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 have to really read 
what you're buying when you buy these things. So that's just, if, if some of you are into marine aquariums, you really need to look at where these fish are from. So again, here's a mandarin goby or man, man, mandarin dragon net aquarium condition, as well as the wrasse, this uh, carpenter flasher wrasse is aquarium condition. Now there is a company in Panama called Bocas Mariculture. And they are breeding local Caribbean fishes that originate from wild caught animals in their facility. They're not bringing in fish from any other part of the world. So there's not a danger of invasives or any exotics escaping their facility. They're, they are only breeding fish that are found in the area. So they believe in sustainability. Um, all their animals are farm raised. They don't support wild collection anymore. Um, they only uh, work with organisms that are native to the area. They don't use harmful chemicals or antibiotics. Um, and so they are really doing things that tend to be less harmful, non-harmful to the environment. Um, and let's look at some of the organisms they're, they're, they have. So they have um, zoanthids and corallomorphs, which are your, you know, your button polyps. Uh, they're working with invertebrates. And they're working with the local fishes. So gobies, uh, small bass, and blennies. So again, they're not working with these larger fish whose larvae tend to spend a lot of time in, in, uh, in the water column as, as planktonic larvae, uh, the gobies, the blennies um, tend to spend less time in the water column than those other fish. But again, this is a company that has taken on captive breeding. Now it's very easy to go out and collect fish. I mean, that's, that's the easy thing to do. It's very difficult to try to breed these fish in captivity. You know, for freshwater fish, very common, you know, wild caught fish now are, they say less than 10% of all the fish that you see at your, uh, as you guys would say, LFS, um, only 10% of those are probably wild caught. Most of them are captive bred. But if you go into the marine section, the saltwater section of your aquarium stores, and you look at the fish, it's probably gonna be 99% of those fish are wild caught. It's only gonna be 1% that are captive bred. And those are primarily will be your designer um, clownfish. So we need to start advocating for more, for more captive bred saltwater fish. They're going to be a little bit more expensive, but sometimes, you know, that expense is worth it because we're not decimating the wild populations. If, you know, we'll get into the case of, of, uh, with some areas like, um, Hawaii. Hawaii, number one crash, cash crop for their, mar their marine fishes was wild caught yellow tanks. Hawaii shut down the whole collection of wild tanks because they were the Department of Natural Resources was saying that they were over collecting and that they were decimating the population. Whether that's true or not, um, that's for me not to argue, um, but they shut it completely down. Pretty much shut it down overnight. And so here we had thriving businesses that were exporting 
hundreds of thousands of yellow tangs from Hawaii every year, all of a sudden it was zero. And so these companies were really hurt. And so we have areas of the world that are going to continually shut down their, their wild collections. Sure. Indo-Pacific region, Indonesia, uh, Palau, um, some of these smaller countries who need that income from um, the exportation trade, it, it would probably take a long time for them to shut their systems down. But they're still having some impact on the environment, especially when you think you're collecting these juvenile or sub-adult fish to adult fish. You're removing the breeders from your population. And if less than one tenth of 1% of all these larvae ever make it back, you can see how these adult fish, collecting of these adult fish can really impact um, the recruitment of new individuals into the population. So that's all I wanted to say today. Um, I keep them short. I don't want to bore you guys. I don't want to have you fall asleep. I know Rico, it's about Rico stands. It's, it's his um, nap time right now. And Skipper's about ready to, you know, kill over. So if we have any questions in the audience, uh, please, uh, mods, um, please post those questions again. Um, so I can see them because I, you know, StreamYard doesn't show up all the questions. Um, and I have to look over. You're going to see the side of my face um, when I look at the, the YouTube. I have it on my iPad next to me. Um, so any questions here, please ask. Um, one thing I do want to share, uh, pinned in the, the very top is the raffle. We're still having the raffle ongoing. Um, we are halfway through and probably three quarters of the way uh, finished with, with the tickets that are going to be sold. So if you're interested, please, um, please buy a ticket or two or five. Uh, you can also on that same uh, raffle page, if you just want to donate a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, please do. Uh, we live and die off our, our donations. Um, and also this Saturday, a window, this Saturday, uh, one Saturday a month at the Research Center, uh, we have a live stream on Zoom. We then put it on uh, YouTube later on. Uh, we have a series of talks called Talk with the Experts. Um, the next one is, will be this Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time. So whatever time it is for you, you know, if you're in Arizona, you don't change time. So I have no clue what time it is for you guys. Uh, 5 p.m. UTC. We're going to have uh, Dr. Harmony Patricio um, talk to us. Harmony works with an organization called Shoal. And Shoal is um, interested in conservation of all freshwater environments. So not only the fish, but the invertebrates, the plants, um, everything in fresh water. Um, so she'll talk to us about uh, what Shoal does, some of the work Shoal has done in the past. Um, we actually work very closely with Shoal. We have a, a good relationship with them. Um, so please, um, if you're interested in listening to, listening to the talk live, you, we they go for about an hour and then we have a question and answer afterwards. Um, I will post the link here. You have to register for it just because we we give you a um, the the passcode to get into the Zoom talk. Uh, but again, if you can't make it, we do post those uh, within about two weeks of the talk. Uh, depends on how fast I get them. Uh, Three weeks ago, we had Dr. Paul Wazell talk to us about um, conservation of Madagascar fishes. Uh, that will be posted within the next week. So we, you know, we're here to educate people. That's 
the main goal of the Amazon Research Center, educating the public, uh, educating the fishermen, educating the people in Peru. So if you're interested, um, I again will post this link after this live stream um, goes into the recording section of YouTube. Um, so please do. Uh, let's see. Mm, no questions. Let's see. Questions. Mm -hmm. mm, I guess you, I dazzled you with all this information. Anybody have any questions about anything else? I'm trying to find no questions. That's fine with me. I actually have to do the dishes this morning, so. Okay. If that's it, I thank you all for showing up. Eduardo, Skipper, Patrick, Didi, Alishan, Hippie John, Allison, Patrick Hardy, Jay Oliver, thank you. Hi, Jess. Thank you for showing up. Vinay Color Guppies, thank you. Geek Boy, Dee Dee for modding, Patrick Hardy. Let's see. I miss anybody. Alishan, Patrick Hardy. I'm saying names again. Paul Soltero. Thank you for modding. Appreciate all those who are here. All those who pay attention to me. On the way out, if you hit the like button, hit the like button. On the way out, if you uh, didn't like it, hit the dislike button. You either like it or you don't. You give me, you take me as I am, as the old song goes. So thank you, everybody, for attending this morning. Um, next week's live stream, I'll be in Peru. Um, so I'm going to have some stuff pre-recorded to begin with, just in case um, Internet is funky. But you will hear me from Peru. Um, and I'll show you the, um, the research center. Uh, what's going on in the aquarium, um, just some of the fish that we have right now uh, that are being quarantined to put into the aquarium. So I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you all again for showing up and treat your fish well, do your water changes, and feed your fish whatever they need to be fed. Thank you.